Hello, this is Dr. A. So we're going to do part two of the cardiovascular system chapter. So we're going to look specifically at the circulatory system. Okay, so let's talk blood vessels. So the blood vessels are the arteries, arterioles, capillaries, venules, and veins. And they form a closed circuit that carries blood away from the heart to the cells and then back again to the heart. Um, arteries are strong, elastic vessels. And they're adapted for carrying high pressure blood. And um, arteries always carry blood away from the heart. So uh, if you think about it that way, it makes sense because the blood that's being pumped away from the heart is always going to be high pressure blood. So um, arteries carry blood away from the heart. Very important to remember that. Um, and those arteries, of course, um, as they leave the heart, become smaller and smaller as they divide and give rise to the arterioles, which will eventually give rise to the capillaries. The wall of an artery consists of the inner layer, which is an endothelium layer, which is uh, continuous with the inner layer of the heart. And the uh, tuna, it is called the tunica interna. A tunica media, which is the middle layer, uh, which is made of smooth muscle. And then a tunica externa, which is the external layer, which is made of connective tissue and allows the arteries to be um, anchored in place throughout the body. The endothelium uh, is made of simple squamous epithelium, and it creates a smooth surface to prevent clots. Um, and uh, It also secretes biochemicals. Uh, to prevent platelet aggregation, so again, preventing clots, um, and secrete substances to regulate blood flow, such as like nitric oxide and stuff. So um, this is super important, and if that endothelial layer gets damaged by things such as like high blood sugar and high blood pressure, uh, then you can have a formation of clots and things that um, can then, of course, cause problems such as strokes and heart attacks. Uh, the tunica media, it's a thick layer uh, in arteries and it contracts and dilates the arteries. And as the arteries contract and dilate, it actually modifies the blood pressure. The uh, tunica externa, externa again attaches the artery to the surrounding tissue, anchoring them throughout the body. And uh, arteries, because of the tunica media uh, that is made of smooth, smooth muscles, are capable of vasoconstriction. Uh, and vasoconstriction means that the diameter here will go from bigger to more constricted and that is as directed by the sympathetic impulses so sympathetic impulses or or you remember uh, sympathetic nervous system is for stress you know the heart rate goes up and all of that and so a sympathetic a signal will call constriction right so we go from having this diameter for blood flow to this diameter for blood flow and therefore would raise the blood pressure so that could be another link between stress and high blood pressure as a vasoconstriction. Um, and the walls of the arterioles then and get thinner and thinner as they approach the capillaries. So this is a representation of an artery in a vein. And um, we're going to look at the vein in just a minute, but I'll go ahead and highlight some big differences there. So um, here are the first here are the layers. So the endothelial layer here, so the blood is flowing by here, okay, and the really thick right here, smooth muscle layer, the tunica media, and then uh, the connective tissue layer um, that will wrap around it and of course anchor it in place. The, um, and this is of course a simple squamous uh, epithelium lining the endothelium uh, layer of the artery. So if you look at an artery compared to a vein, the smooth muscle layer is a lot thicker, so uh, it's capable of a lot more vasoconstriction, vasodilation. And the lumen of the artery, which is uh, the amount of space that the red cells have to go through, is much, much smaller than that of the vein. Okay, so um, if you look at the vein, the vein has a couple other features there uh, that are different. So when, uh, so the smooth muscle layer is thinner, the lumen is much wider. And then in their endothelial layer, they have valves also. Um, and valves will allow uh, the blood to be held in certain locations so it doesn't pull back down to the, to the feet due to gravity. Uh, and of course, it has the same type of uh, tunica externa connective tissue coating that helps anchors the vein in place. On this picture here, 
uh, to the left, if you uh, look at it, there is a cross section. And so you can see the cross section of the artery versus a cross section of the vein. So the vein is much larger here with a much larger lumen, right? Um, and the artery is much denser, a lot more um, smooth muscle than this one and a much smaller lumen. All right, so your first question is going to be, which one do you think is easier to draw blood from, the artery or the vein? So put that in there uh, and we'll, we'll share, I'll share the results later. And then here is a little matching, picture matching. So match uh, the picture to uh, its description, whether it's a vein, a capillary, or an artery. And let's talk capillaries now. So uh, the capillaries are the smallest vessels, and they consist only of a single layer of endothelium. So just simple squamous epithelium. Uh, so really thin, and they're really thin because you they are needed to exchange substances with tissue cells. Um, so your uh, capillary permeability um, varies from tissue, uh, one tissue to the next, due to the openings between the cells. Uh, generally, with more permeability in the liver, in the intestines, in certain glands, and less in muscles. So the permeability um, has to do with how much stuff is let through. And if you think about it, it does make sense to have higher permeability in the liver, in the intestines, because the liver um, have to process and um, detoxify a lot of things, a lot of nutrients, so there would be um, more permeability, there are more things that need to enter the liver and be processed, right? And the intestines, um, it's the side of absorption of all your nutrients. So we need more permeability. We need to allow more things to come in, right? Um, whereas the muscle uh, does have requirements. Obviously, there is permeability there. It's just less so uh, because it only has specific requirements, um, you know, like of glucose and amino acids and stuff. Uh, the pattern of capillary density also varies from one body part to the next. So capillary density is how many capillaries uh, enmeshed or, or networked there is um, per like a, a certain section, the surface area there. And so uh, really dense would mean that there are a lot of capillaries in a, a small section. And if it was not very dense, it, it would be kind of sparse in that section. And so any area with a great deal of metabolic activity, like your leg muscles that you use a lot, for example, would have a higher density of capillaries. So um, just more of them allowing to, to, to bring, um, just it covers more surface area uh, in, in that specific uh, area of the body. Okay, there are also pre-capillary sphincters. Uh, and these guys can regulate the amount of blood that enters into a capillary bed. And they are controlled by the oxygen concentration in the area. So if uh, blood is needed elsewhere in the body, though, the capillary beds uh, are in less important areas can be shut down. So generally speaking, you would think um, if, you were, if you were lacking oxygen in an area, the capillary beds would open up, the uh, pre-capillary sphincters would open up to allow the, the flow to arrive to that area and to provide the oxygen. But uh, if you had, for example, a um, blood volume loss or extremely low blood pressure, um, then the body basically rations it, uh, the, the blood, the volume out to the most important and critical areas, such as, you know, the brain and lungs and heart and stuff. And so it, it moves it centrally um, to the expense of, you know, areas that are less important. So it'd be like your fingers, your toes, your hands and stuff. Um, and so it can shut down uh, the capillary beds in those um, less important areas by completely closing these pre-capillary sphincters. And then you would have fingers that turn blue uh, or a, a nose that turn blue, a lip that turn blue and stuff um, because there's just no blood supply to that area because they're trying to maintain blood supply to the brain and uh, thoracic cavity and stuff like that. So uh, here's a representation of a capillary. So um, these little openings here is um, what allows for um, tissue, um, perme the capillary permeability into the tissue, so for things to be able to leak out. So again, 
higher permeability just simply means there's more of these openings and it's the, the cells are a little bit looser and there's more things um, that are allowed to come in or out of the capillary bed. And then this is an arterial and then right here on the left there, this last little smooth muscle is a precapillary sphincter and sphincter muscles are always circular muscles here that open and close a certain area. So it's like a, a doorway. All right, your next question is, so considering the action of precapillary sphincters, if someone, if someone had a dangerously low blood pressure or a dangerously low blood volume, they, those capillaries would um, blank at the sites such as, um, at sites such as the feet and the hands. So would they close down or open up the capillary bed? All right, so um, exchange, blood ex uh, exchange in capillaries. So blood entering the capillaries always contains high concentration of oxygen because it's coming from the arteries, which are coming from the heart, which uh, it came from the lungs, right? So um, they're bringing those uh, to tissue cells. This is in the systemic circulation, obviously. Um, and so they have a lot of oxygen, they have nutrients that can diffuse out of the capillary wall and into the tissues and feed you, your cells. Um, the, the only molecules that stay behind are the large plasma proteins and uh, because they're too big to fit through the openings. And uh, the other thing that drives, uh, the one, th one thing that drives the movement of these molecules is hydrostatic pressure. So that is the pressure that's been generated by the heart as it pumps fluids through, well, the blood through um, the arteries and arterioles and capillaries. Um, and so that actually pushes some of those fluids out into the capillary bed. And um, some of them just like oxygen and all that can move by diffusion uh, area, high concentration to low concentration, right? Um, and so, so you can see all the things leaving out at the capillary bed and at the venial end, so the blood is flowing right from the arterioles to the venules um, through the capillary bed. So that's the, the direction of the flow. So as it arrives on the venial end, um, it has lost a lot of the fluid, all the nutrients have left and stuff like that. But because the big proteins have left behind, they will, due to the osmotic pressure of the blood, so that osmotic pressure is increased because there's more protein because the fluid is left. Um, so it's, it's um, rel relatively increased, right? Because there's no, nobody's added anything to the system. It's just the, the fluid has left, a lot of the nutrients have left, but the, the big proteins are left behind. And so the, what those proteins will do is pull some of the fluid, some of the water back to itself and return some of the volume of fluid back to the veins, um, which then uh, can be used to uh, return tissue fluid back to the bloodstream. Any excess um, uh, tissue fluid that was not returned to the venules will be, um, will enter the lymphatics. And we will look that in the next lesson and uh, the lymphatics are in charge of returning that fluid to, back to the circulation, but they have a couple specific dump sites basically where uh, it, it's like a, an alternate route of, for the fluid and then it dumps back into the venous circulation at a couple of points in the body. So if you look at all of this uh, illustrated in this, in this picture, so um, here you have the arterial end, right? Bloods come in here with high pressure and so you have the hydrostatic force and that pressure, uh, which is about 35 millimeters of mercury, is pushing nutrients and fluids into the tissues, right? Uh, and there's a little bit of a, a, a por force pulling it is uh, the force of the osmotic pressure. So that would be um, the amount of proteins and salt and other things that is in the, uh, in the, art uh, the, yes, the arterial end here well, we're into the capillary as it pulls here. Uh, so, so there's opposing forces, hydrostatic pressures pushing out, osmotic pressures push up, pulling in, but um, at the, the arterial end, the, is there's always, there should always be a net outward pressure that pushes uh, fluid and nutrients into the tissue bed. So we are at the capillary here, so the stuff is moving. Uh, and all of this fluid is entering this tissue bed and you have lymphatic capillary sh shown here. And um, 
at this Venus and the, the pressure has dropped significantly. So the hydrostatic pressure has dropped from um, 35 here to about 16. So dropped considerably. So the hydrostatic pressure is not strong enough really to be pushing anything else much back into the tissue bed. But uh, the osmotic uh, pressure is higher than it was there because of course you've lost um, relatively the fluids. The fluid is not here, it's there. Uh, so your, con your relative concentration of proteins is higher on the um, venial end so that you have a small net, net inward pressure pulling fluid back to the veins, but it doesn't actually match what was pushed in. So um, 11 uh, millimeters of mercury pressure is pushing fluid into the tissue bed, but only eight is coming back into the venial end. Um, some of it will enter, therefore, into the lymphatic capillaries uh, and then travel back that way. So you have another poll question. So what do you think would happen if a bunch of protein leaked into the interstitial space, which is the pace, space between the cells and the tissues? So would you expect to see swelling at that location? So extra, wind, in, extra water would enter the interstitial space, or would you expect to see dehydration at that location where the water would leave that space? Okay, so moving on to the venules and the veins. So as the fluid is returning, uh, it's moving from the capillaries to the venules and veins. Uh, the venules lead from the capillaries and then emerge to form veins that return blood to the heart. Um, veins have the same three layers as the arteries, except that the muscle layer is thinner, as we saw a few slides ago. And they have flap-like valves here, illustrated here, inside to prevent the backflow of blood. Since um, the blood has to return, especially from areas like the feet, has to return and, and travel up the body back to the heart and work against the force of gravity, then these valves help uh, move the, that blood steadily uh, up, up, up. And so the way these valves work is they're, they're one-way valves, and so um, blood can, can move through it this way, but then as more blood is pushed up this way, the weight of the blood will close the valve, and then that blood cannot go back down. And then, of course, there'll be more blood arriving and pushing, and it just pushes it up one level, pushes it up one level, pushes it up one level until um, it gets all the way back to the heart. Um, the lumen of a vein is larger than that of an artery, so uh, it holds the veins hold a lot more blood than uh, the arteries because they just have a lot more space. Um, they do not carry high pressure blood. That pressure got left behind uh, at the capillary bed. Uh, and veins basically, because uh, their lumen is so much larger and that when you have significantly more veins and you have arteries, they do function as a blood reservoir. So they hold a lot of your blood. And therefore, the question that follows is how much blood do you think is in your venous system approximately? So do you think it's half of your blood, 60% of your blood, 70% of your blood, or 80% of your blood? Um, take a guess. I will share the answer um, later. All right, so let's talk blood pressure. So blood pressure is the force of the blood against the inner walls of the blood vessels anywhere in a cardiovascular system. Although when we use the term blood pressure and we refer to assessing blood pressure in patients and all that, we always refer to arterial pressure, because this is the pressure that we can measure. Um, you could measure the pressure in a venous system if you had a, a measurement tool, capillary or something to go to go into that, that vein and all that. You can measure pressure there, but that's not that's invasive and it's not feasible. What you measure, measure with a blood pressure cup is arterial pressure. So that arterial pressure obviously rises and falls following a pattern that's established by the cardiac cycle. So um, if you remember from our previous lesson, um, part of the, the cycle, we have ventricular contraction. Um, and in, when the ventricles contract, the arterial pressure would be at its highest, highest and that would be systolic pressure. Because remember, ventricular contraction is ventricular systole. So systole is uh, contraction, and therefore your systolic pressure is going to be your highest pressure, because it's the pressure when the heart is pushing that blood, it's contracting, it's pushing the blood into the system, right? 
Uh, and then when the ventricles are relaxing, the arterial pressure would be at its lowest and uh, the ventricles relaxing are, is called diastole. And so that would be your diastolic pressure. It would be the lowest pressure in the arterial system. Um, the pressure decreases as distance from the left ventricle increases. So basically, uh, the further away you are from the heart, the lower the pressure in that arterial system. The blood pressure cuff is called a sphygmomanometer. Thankfully, we don't call it that every day. And it's used to measure the arterial blood pressure. Uh, an average uh, blood pressure would be 120 over 80. That's your systolic over your diastolic. So um, the surge of blood that occurs um, with, it, with the ventricular contraction can be felt at certain points in the body, and that is called a pulse. So if you put your fingers here, uh, you can feel, you can put two, or you can put it here, your carotids, whatever. Uh, even you can put it here at your brachial. Uh, you, you can feel your heart beat that, and that is a pulse, okay? So uh, check, check your radial artery, your carotid, or your brachial, and is it the femoral is the one there uh, in your groin. So those are all uh, places where you can assess uh, the pulse on someone, just, and from that you can you know, get a heart rate. Um, factors that influence your arterial blood pressure. Um, so there are several factors. So it depends on cardiac output, on the blood volume into, into you know, your entire blood volume in your entire system on peripheral resistance and blood viscosity. So let's look at each of these things specifically and explain them. Okay, so uh, cardiac output is basically how much your heart puts out. Okay, that's, that's, uh, that's very simplistic. But if you think about it this way, so when you're, you're especially you let's look at the left ventricle, when blood is entering into your left ventricle and that left ventricle pumps that blood out into the arterial system, how much blood is that? Is that 70 milliliters? Is that, or each, each one, um, uh, you know, like we have an average here listed as 70 milliliters, but what if it's 65? What if it's 75, right? So, um, what, what does your heart put out volume wise with each beat, okay, into the arterial system? So um, a cardiac output is calculated. It's the stroke volume, so how much how much it puts out, times the heart rate. So obviously, if it beats 50 times a minute and puts out 70 mils every time it beats, versus uh, beating 100 times a minute uh, with 70 mils each time it beats, um, the higher heart rate is going to have double the cardiac output. Okay, and so. Um, the, um, the, those, both of those things, so the stroke volume and the heart rate are two things that can influence cardiac output and then cardiac output influences blood pressure. So, uh, again, an, an average stroke volume for a person would be around 70 mils. Um, and so again, it's how much the uh, blood is contract is, uh, exits that, uh, left ventricle as it enters into the arterial system. Uh, and the heart rate, obviously, is the number of bits, beats per minute. Um, an average number of beats per minute minutes is 72. So 60 to 100 is normal on your heart rate. Okay, so let's think about it this way now. If your stroke volume goes down because your heart is damaged, let's say from a heart attack, um, what would happen to your heart rate if the body is trying to maintain the same cardiac output, for example, to maintain blood pressure? Would your heart rate increase or would it decrease or decrease, increase, depending on how it, you see it listed here? So again, if your stroke volume goes down because your heart is damaged from a heart attack, so it's, it's not pumping out as much as it should, would your heart rate increase or decrease to maintain the same cardiac output? So think about that logically. Okay, so um, the next factor that does influence um, arterial pressure uh, or blood pressure is blood volume. So this one is pretty simplistic, and I am going to move this for a second here. Um, it's just if you're if you're low in blood, if you don't have a lot of volume, or if you're dehydrated, right? There's not a lot of volume in your cardiovascular system then uh, your, the pressure in the system is going to be low. Just like if there's not a lot of water in your pipes, 
somebody shut the water off, the pressure in your pots when you turn the faucet on is going to be non-existent. Okay, All right. So um, normally blood pressure is directly proportioned to the volume of blood in a cardiovascular system. The volume of blood in a cardiovascular system is uh, regulated by the kidneys and uh, that's like water balance and all of that, which will be another chapter. Um, and, but that volume does vary with age, body size, and gender and all of that. Either way, you should have, uh, a no with a normal blood, blood volume, you'll have normal blood pressure. If you have significant loss of volume, you will have a significant drop in blood pressure. Now, peripheral resistance is the resistance in the, the, the arteries and capillaries and stuff like that. So uh, friction between the blood and the walls of the blood vessels is a force called peripheral resistance, and it hinders blood flow. So it resists flow of blood. So that is why it's called peripheral resistance. And per periphery is away from the center. So then you, you would think arteries, um, veins, uh, capillaries, and stuff like that, right? So as peripheral resistance increases, such as during the sympathetic constriction of blood vessels, blood pressure will increase. So remember I said like, Stress is, uh, and generates per, uh, sympathetic impulses, right? And so that sympathetic impulses could constrict your blood vessels. If, if your blood vessels go from bigger to smaller, or as illustrated here, bigger to smaller in diameter because they're being constricted because of stress, your blood pressure is going to increase. So there is an increase in peripheral resistance from the vasoconstriction. Um, so uh, dil a dilation of blood vessel could cause um, that blood pressure to decrease. Um, and so that some of the blood pressure medications can work to uh, accomplish that. Okay, so if your patient is severely dehydrated, would you expect them to have a high blood pressure or a low blood pressure? And would plaque in the arteries increase or decrease peripheral resistance? Answer that. Okay, and then the last factor that influences blood pressure is viscosity. Viscosity is thickness. Um, a good description of a viscous liquid is honey. So honey is thick and sticky, right? That is viscous, okay? Uh, so viscosity is the ease of blood flow due to the thickness of the blood. Uh, the greater the viscosity of blood, the greater its resistance to flow. So it increases in a way uh, peripheral resistance. Increased viscosity would increase resistance to flow and therefore um, it would uh, cause greater blood pressure. So uh, if you think about it, uh, for example, somebody with a really high blood glucose, their blood is thicker just because there's more stuff that, you know, that's suspended in the blood. There's a lot more sugar, so it would have higher blood viscosity. So, um, all these things can increase blood pressure. So a blood volume increase would increase blood pressure. Heart rate increase would increase blood pressure. A stroke volume increase would increase blood pressure. These two, heart rate and stroke volumes, are factors of cardiac output. Peripheral resistance increase would increase blood pressure. And blood viscosity increases would increase blood pressure. So there's a lot of factors that can go in there to increase blood pressure. Okay. Next question, would a blood glucose of 680 increase or decrease the blood viscosity as compared to a normal blood glucose of less than 100? So answer that. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the control of blood pressure. So um, blood pressure is determined by cardiac output times peripheral resistance. Um, and uh, the body maintains a normal pressure by adjusting cardiac output and peripheral resistance. So how can it adjust that? With a cardiac output, it can increase or decrease the heart rate, which would then increase or decrease the cardiac output. And with a peripheral resistance, it can do vasoconstriction, vasodilation, right? So if it constricts, it increases peripheral resistance. If it dilates, it decreases peripheral resistance. And so the, the you know, with control centers in the brain and all that in the brainstem, the goal here, of course, is to maintain uh, a stable pressure in the system so that you have nutrients and blood flow to all the organs of the body. Uh, the Frank starting law of the heart is really interesting. It's, uh, it denotes a relationship between the fiber length and the force of contraction. And so we are, what we're referring to 
um, is the, the fiber length, the stretch length inside the ventricles, okay? So uh, as blood flows into the ventricle, how much blood flows in stretches those fibers, and then the more they are stretched, the harder they contract because the more volume there is to empty out of that ventricle. And so that allows your heart to completely empty the ventricle every time, whether it's getting, let's say, 50 mils of blood or 75 mils of blood, right? Uh, and so that's the Frank starting law of the heart, and that allows for everything that enters the heart to leave the heart, okay? So, uh, so more, more stroke volume coming in will cause a stronger contraction, which then, of course, uh, would increase, uh, you know, the stroke volume, the volume coming out, the stroke volume in cardiac output. So, uh, more fluid coming into the ventricle um, means more fiber stretch, means a stronger contraction, means a higher stroke volume, therefore a higher cardiac output. All right. So, there are also baroreceptors. Those are pressure receptors. Um, on, over your body, and uh, they sense changes in blood pressure uh, and send that information to your brain, which then, of course, then can modify factors that it has control over to um, regulate the blood pressure. So uh, the volume of blood, blood that enters the right atrium is normally equal to the volume leaving the left ventricle. If the arterial pr pressure increases, the cardiac center and the medulla oblongata, your brainstem here, sends parasympathetic impulses to slow the heart rate down. So that's the cardio inhibitory reflex, okay? And so remember, sympathetic will increase your heart rate, parasympathetic decreases your heart rate, okay? If the arterial pressure drops, the medulla oblongata, again, same, the cardiac center, will send sympathetic impulses to increase the heart rate and adjust the blood pressure, and that's the cardio accelerate reflex. All right, so uh, your body needs to raise your dangerously low blood pressure, but it cannot constrict your arteries any more than they already are. It must therefore modify cardiac output. Your stroke volume is remaining the same, which is low, due to a low blood volume and the inability of the nurses to start an IV. Would you expect your heart rate to go up or to go down? So answer me that. Think through that one for a second and answer that. Okay, so let's talk about uh, other factors that can control blood pressure. So uh, emotional upset, exercise, and a rise in temperature can all result in increased cardiac output and increased blood pressure. Most of that is because, of course, it's going to increase the heart rate. So we know um, a rise in temperature exercise and emotional upset can all increase your heart rate. All right, and um, peripheral resistance also controls blood pressure. So again, um, the sympathetic nerves can change the diameter of the arterioles uh, in response to blood pressure changes. So vas vasodilation will decrease peripheral uh, resistance and decrease blood pressure. So dilation is making them bigger. Vasoconstriction, making them smaller will increase peripheral resistance and increase blood pressure. The uh, vasomotor center of the medulla oblongata can adjust the sympathetic impulses to the smooth muscles in the arterial walls, therefore adjusting blood pressure. So again, medulla oblongata, cardiac center, vasomotor center, there, uh, it's the one sending those signals either through the sympathetic or the parasympathetic branches. Uh, so again, sympathetic would uh, cause constriction and, and increase in blood pressure. Parasympathetic would cause dilation and a decrease in blood pressure. Uh, certain chemicals can also affect peripheral resistance um, by affecting the precapillary sphincters and smooth muscles of the arterial walls. So if you have an increased CO2 and a decreased O2 and a decreased pH, you can cause vasodilation, which makes sense because it means that that area needs more oxygen, needs more blood, so it would dilate, right? Um, and uh, bring oxygen and nutrients into tissues with high metabolic needs. Um, epinephrine and norepinephrine, which is the same as adrenaline and noradrenaline, which are released in times of stress, would cause vasoconstriction because uh, stress and vaso uh, stress and that adrenaline will increase um, blood pressure, and it does that by vasoconstriction. 
Okay, so we got another question for you to answer. Would epinephrine raise or lower your blood pressure? Okay, so let's talk a little bit about venous blood flow. So the blood flow through the venous system is only partially the result of the heart actions, so the heart pumping, right? Uh, but instead usually depends on skeletal muscle contractions, so you moving around during the day, breathing movements, so the movement of your chest, you know, in and out, that causes pressure changes and things to help draw blood back up. And uh, vasoconstriction, um, the vasoconstriction of angels is called venoconstriction. So there is uh, some smooth uh, muscle in the layer, um, the tunica media of your, your veins. And so that can actually squeeze, squeeze, and help push that blood back up. So um, again, the contraction of skeletal muscles squeeze blood back up um, the veins one valve section at a time. And that's why getting up and getting moving uh, can get the blood flowing. So that's really, it's, it's talking about, yeah, the arterial system, but really the venous system more so. Uh, and then, of course, uh, from breathing, it's differences in thoracic and abdominal pressures due to the respiratory uh, draw. Uh, it will draw uh, the blood back up into the vein. And uh, again, the veins themselves can constrict uh, the, and to push the blood back apart. So um, we can review the paths of circulation, which we introduced in the previous module on the heart. So um, the blood vessels can be divided into the pulmonary circuit and the systemic circuit. So the pulmonary circuit are the vessels carrying blood to the lungs and back. Um, and the systemic circuit is uh, the vessels carrying blood to the body, the rest of the body and back. So basically everywhere else but the lungs, okay? Uh, and uh, that is including the coronary circul circulation and the systemic one because it feeds the heart itself. So the heart itself is part of the systemic circulation. Um, so um, the pulmonary circuit is made up of the vessels that convey the blood from the right ventricle to the pulmonary trunk and pulmonary arteries to the lungs. Then the alveolar capillaries that are wrapped around the alveoli in the lungs. And then, of course, the pulmonary veins that lead from the lungs back to the left atrium. The systemic circuit includes the aorta and all of its branches leading to all the body, body tissues, as well as the system of veins that returns the blood back to the right atrium through the vena cava. Okay, so this is a, did you pay attention? Uh, question, is the coronary circulation in the pulmonary or the systemic circulation? So answer me that. And so let's briefly look at uh, each system. So um, in the arterial system, the aorta is the body's largest artery. It goes from the aortic arch and it goes down, right? The principal branches of uh, the aorta. So we have uh, the branches of the ascending aorta are the right and left coronary arteries. So this is right as, as it leaves the heart, as it goes up into its arch there, Rather than leave this ascending, the, you have your right and left coronary arteries. Then uh, the principal branches of the aortic arch, so it arches after it lefts, uh, after it has left the heart, is the brachiocephalic, the left common carotid, and the left subclavian arteries. Then it descends, it goes down. Uh, then we have the descending aorta. We have also known as the thoracic aorta gives rise to many small arteries to the thoracic walls and the thoracic viscera. And then below the diaphragm, you have the abdominal aorta that gives uh, these following branches. We have celiac, superior mesenteric, suprarenal, renal, gonadal, inferior mesenteric, and common iliac arteries. And here is a diagram representing all of these. You can kind of see what they lead to. Um, you can probably uh, find that easier to see in your textbook. But again, so leaving the heart, this is ascending. Here's the arch. And then this is des descending into thoracic. And then once you've passed the uh, diaphragm, you're into the abdominal aorta. Um, so arteries of the head, neck, and brain. So um, the arteries to the head, neck, and brain include the branches of the subclavian and common carotid arteries. The vertebral arteries supply the vertebrae and their associated ligaments and muscles. Um, in the cranial cavity, the vertebral, um, vertebral arteries unite to form a basilar artery, which ends as two posterior cerebral arteries, uh, which help form the cere cerebral arterial circle 
which provides alternate pathways through which blood can reach the brain. So uh, your body really makes sure that you get blood to your brain. This is very important. The thoracervical arteries are short vessels that give off branches to various parts of the neck, shoulder, and back. And the right and left common carotid arteries diverge into the external carotid, the internal carotid arteries. Um, the internal carotid are the major blood supply to the brain. Near the base of the internal carotid arteries are the carotid sinuses that drain, uh, that contain, I'm sorry, certain baroreceptor to monitor blood pressure. So here is a representation of some of those uh, sort of circulation. You can, again, probably see that much better into your textbook. Um, the arteries of the shoulder and the upper limb. So the subclavian artery continues into the arm where it becomes the axillary, axillary artery. And in the shoulder region, the axillary artery becomes the brachial artery that in turn gives rise to the ulnar and radial arteries. And uh, the brachial one is where you get your brachial pulse, and then ulnar and ulnar uh, here, and then uh, radial here. And if you ever wonder, radial's on the side where your thumb is, okay? Um, and then uh, arteries of the thoracic and abdominal walls. So the branches of the thoracic um, aorta and subclavian arteries supply the thoracic wall with blood. So your internal and thoracic artery and anterior um, intercostal arteries and posterior intercostal arteries. And then branches of the abdominal aorta, as well as other arteries, supply the abdominal wall with blood. They are the internal thoracic, external iliac, phrenic, and lumbar arteries. So next easy question, which artery do you use to check your pulse in your wrist? Is it brachial, radial, or ulnar? All right. And arteries of the pelvis and lower limb. So at the pelvic rim, the abdominal aorta uh, divides to form the common iliac arteries, right and left, right, that supply the pelvic organs, gluteal area, and lower limbs. Um, and the common iliac arteries divide into internal and external iliac arteries. The internal iliac arteries supply blood to the pelvic muscles and visceral structures. The external iliac arteries lead into the legs where they become femoral, popliteal, anterior tibial, and posterior tibial arteries. So those would be right and left for sure, one in each leg, right? The venous system uh, returns blood to the heart after exchange of substances as occurred in the tissues. And um, basically, uh, the venous pathways do like um, backtrack the arterial pathways pretty well. So the larger veins parallel the course of the arteries and are named accordingly. Smaller veins take irregular pathways and many of them are completely un unnamed. They're just, they're just, we don't give them names. There are too many of them, right? Veins from the head and upper torso drain uh, into the superior vena cava and veins from the lower body drain into the inferior vena cava. The vena cava um, merge to empty into the right atrium. So veins from the head, neck, and brain, the jugular veins are internal and external jugular veins, drain the head and unite with the subclavian veins to form the brachiocephalic veins. These veins drain into the superior vena cava into the right atrium. And uh, veins from the upper limb and shoulder, the upper limb is drained by superficial and deep veins. The basilic and cephalic veins are major superficial veins, and you might need, uh, use them to draw some blood. The major deep veins include the radial, ulnar, brachial, and axillary veins. Um, and uh, the, med the median cubital vein is the one that actually you draw blood from the most. And that's the median cu cubital vein. Uh, it's large, making it a common side there for vena puncture. And it's the one that's like right here at the bend of the elbow. Okay, so uh, tributaries uh, from the brachiocephalic and azygos veins drain the abdominal and thoracic walls. Um, and blood draining from the abdominal viscera enters into the hepatic portal system and flows to the liver first. So the hepatic portal system is actually quite unique uh, and it doesn't have an equivalent in the arterial system. And it links the intestines straight to the liver so that everything that you absorb goes to the liver first before it goes anywhere else in the body. Uh, and so the liver can process the nutrients absorbed during digestion that way, as well as remove bacteria that have entered the system. 
Um, and so it will, you'll see when we look at the digestive system, it makes the liver kind of unique because it um, has the three things entering, well, and two entering and one leaving. So it, um, it has the portal circulation, but it has the arterial and then the venous circulation, and it's really interesting. So uh, hepatic veins drain the liver, gastric veins drain the stomach, superior mesentery veins lead from the small intestines and colon, the splenic veins leave the spleen, and the pancreas and the inferior mesenteric vein carries blood from the lower intestinal area. So here's a representation of it, and also highlighting that portal circulation that connects the intestines straight to the liver. And uh, so the veins from the lower limbs and the pelvis, deep and superficial veins drain the leg and pelvis. So the deep veins include the anterior and posterior tibial veins, which unite to form the popliteal vein and then the femoral vein, which then becomes the external iliac vein. The superficial veins include the small and great saphenous veins and internal iliac veins carry blood from the reproductive urinary and lower digestive systems. And these veins all merge and empty into the common iliac vein. And that is your last slide. We've seen everything we need to see. And so if you have any questions, enter it there. And I hope you have a good rest of the day.